mainly for, about the monitoring environment. They build it, they create it, and in three seconds we are able to start. Thank you. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Is this thing loud enough? It's not loud enough? Can it turn it up a little, or is that possible? Hello, hello, hello. Test, test. <coughs> okay, otherwise I'll just, ooh, oh, there, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Lenzer. Uh, I'm uh, a system engineer at a Dutch company called Hives.nl. Um, to give you a little idea about what Hives is exactly, because I'm assuming most of you have never really heard of uh, Hives. Uh, we're a Dutch social networking website. Uh, Currently, uh, the biggest one in the Netherlands still. Uh, we have about 10 million Dutch users, and uh, we, they generate about 3 billion page views a month. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to read all the statistics here. So, just to give you an idea, we have about 100,000 photo uploads a day, and they generate about 6 gigabit of uh, daily outgoing traffic. Uh, to give you a little more information about uh, what our uh, technical environment looks like, uh, we have about 3,000 hosts, uh, which are all running Gentoo, so it's just one big cluster. Uh, they're divided over uh, three data centers, so we have uh, three different locations. Uh, these uh, 3,000 servers, uh, we have them, uh, we can divide them into uh, around 190 different types of servers. So we're uh, talking uh, web servers, uh, database X servers, database Y servers, uh, caching servers, um, you name it. Uh, we have 160 employees at our company. Uh, our system engineering team is a mere 12. Uh, we have 45 developers, so we're uh, pretty much outnumbered uh, at our company. Um, before I start talking about uh, our current environment, uh, I'd like to take you back a couple of years. Uh, about five or six years ago when I joined Hives, uh, we had a mere 150 servers. Um, they were all uh, in one data center. Um, we had just the four system engineers back then, uh, which was me, another intern. Uh, we had one uh, full-time system engineer and uh, another one also working on the, his uh, thesis. Um, like most of you, uh, we, have, we had just the one Nagios instance which was monitoring the whole thing and it was complete manual configuration. Uh, now, at some point, uh, Hives became rather popular. Um, we had people telling other people, uh, hey, look at Hives, it's great, and you should join. And more people started joining, more people started joining, so that required uh, us to expand our server park for uh, storage or performance reasons. Um, and we started receiving uh, batches of 100 to 200 servers at a time. Um, and that makes manual configuration of your Nagios uh, uh, setup quite uh, yeah, unmanageable. I mean, uh, if you're unboxing 200 servers with just four persons and racking them in a server park, then you, you don't want to go back to the office and manually type in 200 servers and check this, check that. So we, we had to do something about that because this was not going to uh, last long. So what we did was uh, we started creating templates for uh, hosts and host groups. Uh, we defined our uh, service checks uh, per host group. Uh, because uh, all of the machines within a certain host group period pretty much had to have the uh, exact same things checked. Um, and we created scripts uh, to fill up these templates um, based on the information that was in our uh, server management database. We have this database which is uh, home built. Um, it contains information of all of our servers. Uh, it tells you uh, what the IP address is of the machine, what the function is of the machine, where it's racked, um, everything. So we have a pretty uh, up to date source of what's going on in our server park. Uh, the service dependencies uh, were generated uh, as well because uh, you don't want to type in saying uh, if NRPE uh, doesn't work then this doesn't work, this one doesn't work. So what I started doing was uh, prefixing all of our uh, check name uh, names with uh, check NRPE, check SNMP, check um, whichever and based on that 
uh, I built the entire uh, service dependency configuration per host. But unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, because I mean, it's great. Uh, we kept on growing and growing even more. Uh, so at some point, we extended to three data centers. Uh, our server park uh, grew even larger to about 1,500 hosts at the time. And uh, it was starting to get a problem, uh, started to become a problem, sorry, to monitor the whole thing with just a single Nagios instance. Especially if you have three data centers and you lose one uplink and you get your mailbox pretty much full with all of the machines in that data center that they're all down. So. So we started setting up a distributed Nagio setup. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually set up a distributed Nagio setup, but this is, as far as I know, pretty much the default way to do it. Uh, you've got one central Nagio server, which, you, uh, which has the entire configuration for all of the uh, distributed hosts. Uh, we use it for monitoring and uh, for the web interface, because you want to be able to see in the web interface what the status of your entire server park is. Uh, around that we had the nine distributed monitoring hosts. Um, it, it required a little bit of changes to the uh, current scripting we had to generate the configuration because we had to uh, spread it out over the uh, nine distributed Nagios hosts. So uh, what we did was um, based on the uh, name and the location of that monitoring server uh, we put, uh, we created a list, sorry, let me start over. We created configuration files, uh, which contained a list of uh, function types that we had, and we did that for uh, three, piece, uh, three parts, and based on the name of the Nagios server, so you had Nagios 1-DC1, Nagios 2-DC1, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it would take that configuration file and build a uh, automatic configuration uh, based on what was listed in the function uh, config. Now, one of the problems we had, and some of you may have had as well, um, what happens if uh, you lose your Nagios machine? I mean, you could put freshness checks on all of your checks and uh, wait for them to eventually start complaining about, um, oh, I haven't received any updates about this service for the last an hour, 30 minutes, uh, whatever you want. Um, but that means, again, getting a long list of all of the machines that haven't been checked in a while. Uh, so what we started doing was we set up a, a knock monitoring machine, and we had that machine monitor all of the uh, network peripherals and the Nagios machines themselves as well, just to make sure that they're still functioning the way they're supposed to function. That worked pretty well for uh, quite some time, um, but at some point our uh, central server, he started having some very big problems with uh, the large configuration. Uh, that was mostly during uh, reload, so if you reload the uh, Nagios daemon, it would just take a very long time for that thing to actually boot up. Uh, that basically means that in between when it went down and when it's finally done loading, you don't have any, uh, any monitoring, any alerting, you have nothing. And the biggest problem that we had was that the uh, monitoring server would just freeze uh, when we had some large fallouts. Uh, we lose the data center, then it sends out a bunch of text, mes text messages, and um, it would just freeze. It tried to send out the notifications, but it couldn't get them out, and when it can't send out the notifications, it's not processing any of the other incoming uh, checks that were coming in. Um, and the web interface wouldn't load anymore. So if you tried to pull up an overview of all of your problems, then the web interface, it just wouldn't start anymore. So what we did back in uh, November 2010 uh, was we started looking into Isenga. Uh, one of the things that drew me to Isenga was the fact that it doesn't require a central monitoring host, so you can basically just keep on scaling your monitoring host if at some point you need more. Uh, the standalone web, uh, web interface, you don't need to have the web interface uh, necessarily on the exact same machine that's doing the monitoring. Uh, same thing goes for the database backend. You can just set up two new machines with the database and use that. Uh, then there's the API, which uh, I started thinking about and had some pretty good ideas about uh, how to get that working and what to do with it, the possibilities that uh, 
came with that, uh, with the, the rapid development uh, for Isinga, uh, and there were a lot of people working on it and working on it. And best of all, migration was relatively painless. The only thing I needed to do was run one set command to replace everything that's called Nagios and replace it with Isinga, move the configuration files, start the whole thing up, and it was done. And this also meant that we could still use the uh, scripting that we already had uh, to build the configuration for uh, our new Asinga machines. <laughs> to give you a little uh, information about the Asinga setup that we currently have running, uh, we've got 12 Asinga hosts running right now. Uh, we, we still have the one NOC host. Uh, right now they're checking about 100,000 service checks uh, and uh, we grew to about 3,500 uh, machines in our three data centers. I put a little graph in here. I don't know if you can actually see it, but uh, during peaks, we do about 15,000 checks per minute right now. And as you can see, they're all uh, scheduled active checks. So we don't really use any passive checks. It's mostly just active checking. Uh, we also split off the uh, web interface and the database hosts. Uh, what we did was uh, we set up two machines uh, with a MySQL database backend, uh, put them into a circular replication. So it doesn't matter in which one of the two machines you insert the, your, your check results, uh, it'll always end up on both machines. Uh, that also means that you can load balance them. So you can just, yeah, load balance them. Uh, and you can also load balance the API. So if one machine can't handle any of the API requests that need to be done, you can just uh, put two machines in that load balancer, have that uh, web interface running on those two machines, and you can just use the API. And this also allows for some very handy uh, failovers. So if one of those two machines dies, you just kick it out of the load balancer and keep running, and there's no one that actually knows the difference, uh, except for me, because I have to fix it. But. Oh, and one of the other things is uh, we don't actually load balance the web front end because you have the logged in sessions that were causing some problems when we started loading, uh, load balancing that. Uh, so you also need to change one DNS record to move the CNAME to the other host if that's necessary. Okay, so. Uh, actually making use of the API. Uh, one of the things we started doing early on uh, was grouping certain checks for certain host groups together uh, in order to minimize the amount of notifications that you get in. Uh, I mean, if someone at development screws up somewhere and uh, has all of the web servers crashing, I don't want to get 250 notifications saying, oh, your web servers aren't running anymore. I just want to get the one notification that says, oh, hey, I've got 250 uh, web servers that aren't running. I mean, uh, we've had that at the beginning, that we had large amounts of text messages arriving. Uh, and I, I think I actually managed to kill a couple people, their phones. Yeah, oh yeah a couple of colleagues that their phones actually crashed. So that makes it even harder to do your standby shift if you crash your uh, on-call telephone. Uh, a small example here is the, uh, it's a Python script. Uh, it uses some of the libraries that I've created, but I'll get into that later. Uh, it's called check monitoring overview. Uh, you specify the host group, you specify one or multiple services that need to be okay, and you can specify warning thresholds based on a percentage or just a uh, regular number. Uh, in this case, all of the web servers were fine, and uh, it's all good, so I didn't have to do anything. Okay, missing monitoring. Uh, some of you may have had this problem as well. Uh, you've set up a great monitoring environment, you think everything's running perfectly fine. Then at some point, someone uh, walks up to you and he's like, hey, did you know that uh, database this or that uh, died two or three days ago? And I'm like, two or three days ago? No, I don't think so. Why should I? Yeah, yeah, it's on this and that machine. I'm like, I don't know if there's a database running on that machine. Yeah, I set that up last week. And I was like, Okay, and you're assuming that I know that you set that up and that I automatically arrange monitoring for you? Uh, I mean, I, I have better things to do than go through the entire server park to see if anyone changed or added anything. Uh, so you tend to get a lot of angry people uh, at that point. So our solution to this problem, 
Puppet. We've been using Puppet for a couple of years now. Uh, Puppet's a configuration management tool. It allows you to create a list of modules uh, for, uh, well, Nginx, Postfix, SNMP. Uh, and you can create a role module in which you basically define uh, that this server needs to have this installed, that installed, that installed, and that installed. Uh, so Puppet pretty much knows everything. I mean, we install our servers uh, quite rapidly, and uh, we have Puppet configuring them. Uh, so within 15 minutes, we have a complete server up and running, uh, freshly reinstalled. Uh, so everything that needs to be on a server is in Puppet. So we figured, why not use Puppet, right? To give you a small example of uh, how the Nginx module in this case uh, would look in Puppet, I mean, this is just a very basic uh, Example, uh, you specify the package, you say uh, this machine needs to have Nginx installed and the service Nginx needs to be running. And then in the role, you specify that the web server role, which is the uh, name of the function as we have defined it in the server management database, and needs to have Nginx included. So, luckily for me, uh, Puppet already supports uh, Nagios resources. So uh, I didn't really have to change much there. All I needed to do was define them and use them. Uh, these resources, they're typically called exported resources. Why? Because a regular resource would uh, generate a file on the local machine. And generating your monitoring configuration on the machine itself doesn't really make much sense if you need to have it monitored by your monitoring servers. Uh, so what happens is these exported resources, they're generated and they're stored in a MySQL database backend or Postgres or whichever you want to use. Uh, and we started to define our monitoring checks in the matching module. So if you take the example of the Nginx module, uh, you add that piece of code there and that's it. So we've got the uh, uh, HTTP servers. Uh, you specify which check command needs to be used as it is uh, defined in your check command uh, configuration. Uh, you can specify event handlers. Uh, you can specify contact groups. You can specify everything. Um, now, because I'm a relatively lazy system engineer and I don't want to keep on redefining every single thing every single time I add a new monitoring check, uh, we predefine that stuff. So what we do is we predefine uh, for the Nagios service exported resource that it needs to be present, because if it's not present, then it's still not going to be there. So it doesn't make much sense to, uh, to use it. And we predefine the host name with the host name and the domain variable that Puppet has. Um, we say use the generic service template as we have defined it. And um, make sure that the not notifications are either enabled or disabled. So what this thing here is, it's a local variable, and uh, based on what the system status is for the global variable, it uh, returns either operational or fail, and it turns the notifications on if it's operational, and if it's failed, it'll turn it off, because personally, I'm not very interested in HTTP running, uh, not running, sorry, on a web server that's not even operational. I mean, sure, I'm interested, but I don't want to get a text message or get it in my mailbox. Uh, you can specify the target, so you can say, I want to have this uh, service check defined in this file. Now, what we did was we uh, defined it in a host configure, host configure, host specific configuration file, and we used the notes. Uh, yeah, we used the notes uh, thing uh, to specify the monitoring host. Now, this monitoring host is a global variable again. Uh, very early on in the Puppet run, it uh, creates uh, or it connects to the database and it gets all of the operational monitoring hosts that we currently have and that are in the exact same data center. And it picks one of them based on the modulo and puts that in the variable. Now, if for whatever reason we don't have any monitoring hosts in that data center, we also have a fallback to uh, choose one of the other monitoring hosts that we have just to make sure that it's always, uh, always present. We do the same thing with specifying the Nagios host, uh, specify the host name, uh, specify the host groups to make sure it ends up in one of those host groups. Uh, template again, alias notifications, again on or off depending on what the status of that uh, server, server is. And in order to specify uh, 
the exported resource for the Nagios host. We have a clause called monitoring, and the only thing you need to define is the address because the rest is already predefined. Uh, we then include that uh, clause within the role module, which is inherited by the uh, by the other servers. So if you look back at is that this one? No. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so getting these resources in the database is all nice and fancy and stuff, but you still need to get them out of there because you can't really use the information from the database for your uh, uh, Isinga instance. So what we do here is we, ec we uh, fetch the exported resources based on the uh, nodes variable. So in this case, this piece of code runs on the monitoring machines themselves, and the host name would be the host name of that monitoring machine itself. So it'll only get the services and the hosts uh, that are defined or specified for that monitoring machine. Uh, put some requires in there because you need to have the directories, otherwise you can't place the files in the directories. Okay, so um, creating the configuration, that's all great and stuff, but you want to make sure that your configuration is actually valid. So one of the things that we added to the Isinga class is uh, just uh, we, we uh, created a very basic uh, configuration file for Isinga, which um, specified just the paths of where the configuration files are and have that run with the minus V option to verify the configuration. Um, now, if that thing fails, then the, the entire puppet run stops. So if it fails, it'll leave the configuration files in the pre-generated directory, and it won't do anything with them. Uh, and it'll just leave your monitoring host up and running. If it succeeds, uh, it moves on to the next part, which is uh, moving the configuration files. So what it does is it removes all of the current configuration files in the puppet directory, and it moves all of the configuration files in the puppet generated directory into the regular puppet directory. And after that, it uh, restarts Isinga. Now, this is a very, very nice solution, uh, as long as you don't have uh, an environment that's too big. Uh, in our case, the puppet runs, they started taking about 10 to 30 minutes. Uh, so if you want to run puppet on 12 machines, uh, I mean, sure, we do them in parallel fashion, but it still takes you about 30 to 45 minutes for all of them to finish. Now, I don't want to wait 45 minutes for my uh, monitoring configuration to be put on that machine uh, and it's especially annoying if you want to make uh, quick changes so if you have one configuration problem uh, you want to know that uh, before or if you specify the wrong configuration check you don't want to wait for 45 minutes for that to finish figure it out make the change check it in run it again and wait for another 45 minutes um, and it's even more annoying uh, if uh, the puppet run fails, so it does the verification check, uh, but it does that right at the end of the puppet run. So if you s just spend 30 minutes waiting for your puppet run to finish, and uh, right before the end, it's like, oh, sorry, I have a problem here. Uh, I'm not going to finish my puppet run. Then you're like, yeah, I just waited 30 minutes for that. Couldn't you have told me that before you started running? But no, that's just the way it works. So. Uh, and we figured that most of the time that was uh, spent on this was uh, actually retrieving these exported resources, uh, processing them, and writing them to disk. Um, so yeah, we ran with this for a while, but at some point I got so annoyed, I figured, what the hell, I'm going to do this myself. Uh, it can't be that difficult, right? So uh, I sat down one afternoon, and I created get isinga puppet resources dot by. Um, Basically, what this thing does is it has two defined queries. Uh, it gets all the resource IDs from the database, and for each of those resource IDs, it gets the parameter and the value, and it writes it in the proper format to the uh, file as it is defined in the target. And this thing finishes within 15 seconds. So I'm not entirely sure what's taking Puppet so long, but if it can do it in 15 seconds, then something must be a little bit off there. And this is uh, how it looks in Puppet to actually uh, get these exported resources. 
So it just, uh, you specify the exec, you give it a name, you specify the command as it needs to be run, and again, the requires are in there. And um, you need to adjust the uh, requirements before actually checking the configuration file, because it doesn't make sense to check if you don't have the configuration. Now, there are some other cool things that we can do with Puppet. Um, like I said, Puppet knows everything, but you can also expand Puppet with uh, modules, libraries, uh, stuff like that. So um, we have um, a bunch of daemon servers running, and they have uh, a bunch of daemons running on them. Uh, some of these daemons, they run on all of the machines. Uh, other daemons run on only one or two machines. Others run on half of the machine. So it's very difficult to figure out which daemon is running on which server. Because um, basically the only one that has control over that right now is development, and I'm not going to ask developers uh, every single time, hey, have you moved your demons or have you added any new demons? So I figured, do it myself. And uh, now I don't know how many of you know Ruby or Puppet, um, but what this thing basically does is it creates a so-called factor called Hive's demons. Uh, it just loops through the entire uh, configuration file and uh, fetches all of the unique daemons uh, or the daemon names as they're specified in that configuration file and uh, returns a unique array uh, to Puppet. And this is how we define all of our daemons. So we have a daemons class which is included in all of the, for all of the daemon servers. And we have a custom definition called uh, add daemon check. Uh, which doesn't involve a whole lot more than just specifying the exported Nagios resource. Uh, it uses the name variable over there. Uh, that name variable is being passed uh, onto that definite to that resource uh, when you specify this here. So what happens? Is this is the variable as it was specified in the factor. Uh, so that's basically the array. Uh, it loops through the entire array, and for each item in there, it puts the name of the daemon in the name variable and it just creates the daemon check for you. Okay, so like I said, I'm not a big fan of getting multiple text messages for the same problem. Uh, same thing goes for daemons. Uh, if someone screws up and uh, the daemon code breaks, uh, again, I don't want to have 12 text messages saying, oh, this daemon just died, oh, this daemon just died. I just want to get the one text message. So what I do here is I use the uh, Isinga API to uh, get me a list of all of the unique daemons that are currently running in our monitoring setup. And so uh, this piece of code runs on our uh, NOC server. Uh, the NOC configuration is generated after we generate the regular uh, monitoring configuration. Um, so they have already loaded up their latest uh, configuration, uh, inserted the information into the database. So er everything that's currently in the API when this piece of code runs is uh, up to date. So I always get an up to date uh, list of all of the uh, demons that are in the configuration. Uh, yeah, it's not very interesting to explain all of this. Basically, it just does the HTTP get for the proper year constructed URL where uh, the server's name equals something uh, with daemon in it and it returns the server's name column and it uh, uses that result to put that in the uh, daemon's array uh, which is then uh, generated into a unique, uh, an array of unique daemons. And this is how we use that. So we create a local variable called daemons. Uh, we say run the function get daemons, which is this thing. Um, we say uh, specify a template file uh, for all of these daemons and uh, use that variable uh, array in the, um, in the template itself. So it'll uh, create this piece of code for each of the daemons that are specified in that array. And that'll give you a complete list of all of the demons that are uh, currently running. Okay, so deployment. Um, I don't want to loop over all of our monitoring machines every uh, time I want to deploy something new. Um, 
So what we did was we built a relatively simple Python wrapper script, which uh, forks the puppet runs for all of the monitoring machines. Uh, it then waits for them all to finish, and it uh, collects the status information of that puppet run. So uh, it gives you a big red fat warning saying, oh, your puppet run for machine this or machine that just failed. Um, if it's all okay, it's all green, and it just continue uh, running the NOC uh, monitoring host. One of the other things that we have in this deploy script is uh, notifications. So what it does is it sends a message to our IRC channel, and it says, oh, Jeffrey is right now, right now Jeffrey is deploying uh, 12 monitoring servers, uh, and that's starting in 20 seconds. We put the delay in there so uh, people can uh, shout at me at IRC saying, oh, hey, wait up, I got something that I need to check in as well, so we don't have to keep on redeploying everything, so we keep that to a minimum. And again, once all of the regular ones start, uh, it'll deploy it for the NOC machine as well. Okay, so, but what if a machine doesn't run Puppet? Uh, if a machine doesn't run Puppet, uh, it's not going to generate any uh, monitoring configuration for you. Now, first of all, if someone sets up a machine, uh, doesn't uh, properly configure Puppet, and doesn't run Puppet on that machine, uh, and then sets it to operational, uh, I'm going to smack him over the head with a rubber chicken because it's just a policy in our company. Uh, configure everything in Puppet and use Puppet. Make sure everything is Puppet controlled because if that machine dies um, and he happens to be on holiday, um, we're the ones who are going to have to figure out what exactly was running on that machine and how do we retrieve it. Uh, on top of that, uh, what we have is that we have a check within our uh, monitoring to check its own configuration. So it uh, gets a list of all the operational machines that are currently in our server management database and should be up and running. Uh, it also retrieves a list of all of the hosts as they are configured in Isinga by using the Isinga API. And it'll give me a notification saying, hey, I'm missing monitoring for server X or server Y. And we also check whether or not the notifications are on because having your uh, monitoring in place for a server, that's all great and stuff, but if you still have your notifications turned off for that thing and it goes down during the night, uh, then no one will know, so they need to be on as well. So what about failover? Um, we don't really have a uh, automated failover for our monitoring, but the way to do that is that we need to run Puppet on all of our machines. Now, doing that takes quite a, lot, uh, quite a lot of time and isn't really necessary to actually run Puppet on all of our machines. So what we did to speed up these Puppet runs is use the minus minus no op option. Uh, so it'll generate all of the uh, resources, export it resources, store it, in the, stores it in the database, but it doesn't actually change any file, install any programming, it just does that part. Uh, one of the other things that we can do with Puppet, uh, which they actually fixed recently in uh, 2.68 or 2.7, I don't remember exactly, is you can use tagging. So what you can do is, I don't think I did that here though. Well, what you can do here, for instance, is you can put a tag on your Isinga class and say that the tag name is Isinga, and you can then run Puppet with just that piece of text. So that allows you to just run Puppet for uh, the monitoring module, for instance, but it'll probably still all collect all of the information that you need. Yeah, so and one, once that's finished, uh, just redeploy Isinga, and it'll rebuild the entire configuration from scratch again. Now, because the notifications are turned off by default for machines that are currently failed, uh, you're not going to get notifications from a machine that uh, previously didn't know that monitoring host. Uh, one of the problems uh, that you have with a distributed setup and uh, failover like that is um, if you uh, acknowledge some problems or you turn off notifications for a service or a host uh, and you do that on that monitoring machine, uh, the other monitoring machine doesn't uh, keep that status information for you. Um, so it'll start rechecking it and it'll start resending notifications to you uh, which means you're going to get a whole bunch of notifications for problems that you're already aware of. So that's another reason why we uh, say, but have Puppet turn off the notifications uh, by default as the default uh, in the configuration so we don't have that problem anymore. OK, 
Okay, so that's it for uh, the Puppet stuff. Um, our system engineering team, we feel very safe and comfortable in the terminal. And especially during uh, large problems, you don't want to uh, have to switch over to a web browser, click through the web browser, get the information of any problems that are currently there. Uh, so what I did was I created a command line tool called ICL. Uh, I actually called it Icinga Action at first, because it made sense. Uh, but then I started getting some complaints from my coworkers saying, no, it's too much typing. It needs to be shorter. It needs to be shorter. So like, OK, um, ICL, is that short enough? And luckily it was, because otherwise you just end up with I or something. And it doesn't make much sense. So what is ICL exactly? ICL is a Python-based command line script. Uh, it uses some uh, libraries that I created myself. Uh, these libraries, they can uh, give you access to the API uh, for Icinga Web. Uh, it also created, uh, I also created some libraries for MK Live status because there's a few things that unfortunately you can't do with the uh, Icinga API, such as turning off uh, text messaging notifications for a specific person. Um, Typically how it works with us is when someone is on call, we automatically turn on their text notifications. And uh, during work or when they're not on call, uh, we also automatically, automatically turn them off. Unfortunately, that is, as far as I know anyway, not something you can do with the API. Someone says it can, then please prove me wrong. Um, there's also a general library that allows you to translate exit code, so the only thing you need to do at the end of your uh, checking script to say uh, I seeing a dot exit underscore okay or warning or critical so you don't have to keep thinking about oh which exit code was critical again um, and it also allows you to translate the status so if you get a status from uh, the API uh, you can translate that number into a, a readable status now that's uh, especially handy because um, the script allows you to get retrieve host and service status information uh, quite rapidly. Um, I'll show you some uh, more of that uh, during the demo. Uh, it also allows you to quickly control your monitoring and alerting. So if you've got a big problem, uh, like I said, uh, we've had phones crashing with too many text messages. It can still happen because unfortunately we don't catch all of it, but you can quickly turn off notifications such as text messaging and things like that. Um, it also allows you to just acknowledge problems in batch, uh, turn off notification for uh, notifications for a new service in batch, and it also uh, gives you the ability to quickly see any open problems. Now, in our case, um, this thing um, uh, doesn't, the open problems view doesn't show any acknowledged problems, but it also doesn't show any uh, problems that have the notifications turned off, because we generally tend to just turn stuff off and not acknowledge everything every single time. Uh, so yeah, that's another thing uh, that could be interesting is whenever you, we use the MK Live Status libraries, uh, it'll first use the API to retrieve which host is currently monitoring the host for uh, which you want to get some information or perform certain actions. So you don't have to go over all of the monitoring hosts that are currently running. Uh, sending that external command saying do this or do that now. Uh, it'll just use the API, it retrieves one of the monitoring hosts that ha is currently monitoring that machine. So you just have to connect to the, uh, the one monitoring host. Now these libraries, they um, integrate relatively well uh, with all of our other tools. Uh, one of the biggest things is that we've ha we have scripting to quickly change status the status of our servers. So we can fail a bunch of servers right at a time. Uh, if you fail a machine, it'll disable the notifications for you. Uh, same thing if you uh, set it to operational, it'll turn the notifications on. Uh, what it does as well is it retrieves the status information from the Icinga API to make sure that all of the checks are okay because uh, you don't want to put a database server on operational. Uh, when the database isn't running because, well, it's going to cause problems. <laughs> so the script will fail and refuse to set the machine to operational if uh, not all of the services are uh, okay. Um, if you set it to deprecate it, uh, so which basically means that if a machine uh, needs to go back to the vendor or we're selling it or whatever, uh, it'll turn off the notifications for that run and it'll also remove the puppet resource from the puppet database. 
so that it doesn't show up again when you do the redeploying of your monitoring. Uh, it also integrates very well with some of our failover scripting. Uh, if you fail over a database cluster because one or multiple machines are broken, uh, it'll fetch a machine from uh, our reserve pool. So it puts in a new machine, uh, runs Puppet, uh, copies over the database, uh, and at the end of it, it'll uh, deploy the monitoring so you make sure that all of the machines that are right now uh, in that cluster are actually in your, uh, in your monitoring right now. And again, it, uh, it allows you to check the status of hosts and services before uh, continuing your scripting. Okay, so I put together a little demo. I hope you can read this because it's... No, it's too dark, isn't it? Well, it kind of sucks. Mm. I think I have that over here somewhere. That's not any better, is it? Damn it. That's a video I pre recorded the whole thing because my coworkers are currently working and I'm afraid that they're going to interfere with the demo. So. Uh, increase this thing. Okay, well, that sucks. Okay, well, I can try to give a live demo then. Where the hell did my mouse go? Come on. Why won't you connect? Specified host is unknown. What? Yeah. Oh, the Wi Fi is up. Yeah, this is a public uh, domain name, so I don't need a specific DNS server to uh, resolve it. I think I just don't have an internet connection. Probably, yeah. Ah, yeah, see, it's not connected. Oh. That's going to take a long time if you don't have an internet connection. <laughs> okay, then I probably need to log in again. So it works. Great. Ah, there we go. That's more like it. Yes. Okay. Um, hang on. Let me just... Remove the monitoring host from Puppet right now. Okay, so if I use ICL and I specify Web1, can everyone read this, by the way? Is that clear enough? Or I can't really decrease the size because it makes it very hard to read the whole thing. Um, okay, so it's, yeah, it's in here now. I need to, damn it, I need to deploy monitoring now. got the 20 second time. So this is why I don't like doing live demos. It's just OK, hang on. I'll just show you how the ICL thing works then. So we've system web one, uh, which is currently. Sorry? 
Ah, right, yeah. If my mouse can find the corner. Is that better? Okay, so ICL minus minus system web one, and it'll give you an overview of all the current services that are running right now. It'll show you the status of the host. Uh, it'll give you information on whether or not the notifications are enabled, uh, whether the checks are actually active. Uh, if the service has failed, it'll tell you whether or not the problem is acknowledged. And uh, I added the attempt account, which could be interesting, I suppose and uh, the output of the current checks. Now, if I were to uh, go to web one, I hope my colleagues are gonna get angry by doing this, and I uh, turn off Nginx on this thing, and I say ICL system one service HTTP. Okay, so it's currently operational, and then I say action check it, and it'll check the, it'll force a check of the HTTP command and it should come back critical. Yeah, so now it's critical and it says uh, connection refused, uh, blah, blah, blah. SVADM, which is our uh, tool to uh, turn stuff off. So I say fail uh, web one right now and it'll, uh, it'll set all of the notifications for web one to disable. So right now if you, uh, pull up the information for web one, uh, you'll see that all of the notifications are turned off right now. Now if I try to put this thing back operational, it'll uh, schedule a check of all of the checks that are uh, currently on the machine, because it could be that the monitoring is uh, lagging behind even though HTTP is already running. Uh, but right now it's not, so it'll give you a big error saying, right now uh, the HTTP service is not okay, so I refuse to put this thing online. Now, if you look at ICL open problems, you should see, you should not see web one in here right now. By the way, yeah, see, I was afraid of this. There's a bunch of crap in here. Sorry, staging environment, so stuff tends to break. Um, okay, so I go back to web one, and I start Nginx, and I say web one. service HTTP, action, check it, and this thing should come back in a few seconds. Yeah, so it's okay again. So if I attempt to put it on operational now, um, it'll succeed and it'll just put the machine back in the load balancer and uh, everything's fine again. And it, again, it'll also enable the notifications for web one right now. Uh, you can do uh, similar things with this, like acknowledging problems. So if you take a look at the open problems view, uh, you'll see that right now the YouTube item iterator daemon is failed for daemon server four. So what I can do is I can say uh, daemon server four service this action acknowledge. It'll acknowledge the problem. And if you pull up the open problems view, it's gone. Ah, and there's a new one in place. As I said, staging environment. Things break. Um, yeah, I mean, I can show you how the deploy script runs, but it's not very interesting. Right now, it's mostly just waiting for the puppet run to finish. But uh, again, it says wait for 20 seconds. No, I'm not going to show this because everyone will be waiting around for that to finish. OK, so I guess that's it then. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything else? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the ICS was, was called ICS, the command line tool. But yeah. ICL, ICL is based on the API. Is it right? Uh, partially, yeah. Yes. And are you thinking about to, to give this project back to the Isinga? I just remembered I have one more slide. Plans for the future. So I want to upgrade to 1.6 yes. at some point. Uh, as far as I know, that's coming out today, right? Yeah, okay, so who knows, maybe I'll migrate the whole thing uh, tomorrow, you know, living on the edge. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I want to clean up the ICL code because right now there's a bunch of crap still in there that doesn't necessarily have to be there. Uh, and I want to make sure that it's compatible with uh, 1.6 because I don't know how much has actually changed in the API compared to 1.4. Uh, so yeah, I might need to make some changes there to actually get it to work. Uh, and I'm planning on putting it up on GitHub once I've stripped out some of the stuff that needs to be, that doesn't need to be in there. Um, one of the other things I want to do is I want to be able to expose the API to our developers uh, so we can have more valuable information uh, f uh, about our demons. I mean, if a demon crashes and right now it says, yeah, it's crashed, but I don't know what's wrong, I still need to look at the server to see what's actually wrong. Uh, so it would be very nice if they could build something within the daemon that just sends something to the API saying this is the current status of this machine and this is the reason why it failed. Um, and I'm thinking about doing some trend analysis based on uh, our Ganglia and Graphite setup. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, I am planning on putting everything up on, uh, on GitHub at some point. Uh, there's a link in here as well to Puppet, if anyone uh, is interested in that. Uh, there's the GitHub link as well on the slide, and if you want to contact me, you can uh, use any of these methods. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about the Pi Web App for deployment within Puppet, and uh, I want to ask if you tested the M Collective thing for, from Puppet Labs? No. Yeah, I have not. <laughs> so, so um, because it, it it looks quite similar. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Um, right now, the uh, scripting it's uh, quite bulky and it integrates with a whole bunch of other stuff that we do. So the scripting, uh, I modified it basically to suit our needs. And uh, to be honest, I haven't really looked into the whole M Collective thing that deep, but I've seen a presentation about it and it pretty much does the same thing. But I think that actually does active checking uh, in a parallel fashion, right? Maybe. I, I don't uh, get into the uh, M Collective thing that deep. <coughs> Any other questions? No one? Okay then, thank you very much.